Hello, this is Wine Festival Online. Welcome to some of you and welcome back to others. Thank you so much for tuning in. So we're Susie and Peter, we're both masters of wine and we are the co-founders of Wine Festival Winchester, which this year is of course Wine Festival Online. Yeah, this year it's all about sort of positivity. We're thinking, you know, um, the pandemic has had a devastating effect on events all around the world, our festival being one of them, but we wanted to do something that just was positive, that, that celebrated good wine and good people. So thank you very much indeed for being part of this. I think we should also probably thank our sponsors for helping make it happen. Absolutely. Wouldn't have yeah, happened without yeah. those. So we've got our headline sponsor, Rathbones, but who else have we got? We've got, we've got the Myers Touch. Family Law, oh. uh, the, My, yeah, the, the Myers Touch, Touch who are responsible for this. Kitchen as well, they do kitchen design. Hilden um, Water. Hilden. P, P, Thursday, uh, and Riedel as well, glassware. So thank you very thank much you. to all of those supporting. So what's coming up now? So we've got right. some... Right, so the Erasaris. Erasaris. Uh, so Erasaris are a Chilean winery, and we've got Francisco... Franz, oh, I knew I wouldn't be able to Francisco say that. Francisco Berti. Thank you. The chief winemaker. He's going to be I've talking wrong, to probably. us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, you can't get... No, no, seriously. So Erasaris is quite historic. Um, founded in 1870. So they're celebrating their 150th anniversary this year. Congratulations to you guys. Well done. That's a great record, isn't it? Do, do you think they were too busy with their 150th anniversary to actually to, to record a long enough masterclass? Yeah, so okay. So we've got it's a little a bit, bit of explaining of to do, which is partly why we're rabbiting on a bit. Um, Get tasting. If you've got the wines in front of you, if you've ordered the wines or you've got some Erasmus wines, get tasting. Probably start with the Sauvignon Blanc, then we move on to the Chardonnay. But definitely get tasting because uh, we, we have to explain that um, Francisco <laughs> is a very, very busy man. He's one of, if not the top winemaker in Chile. He's very much in demand. And for some reason, he only managed to record 10 minutes of a masterclass. He did, he us, did. We did ask we? for 20 or 25. Uh, we've got 10. In fact, I think we've got nine. So what we thought... Yes. Indulge us here. <laughs> Go with us, please. Peter, Peter is quite an expert on Chile, as, as many of you will know. You, you've lived there, mm. you've worked there, you've uh, you've written books about Chile, you're the chair of the Decanter World Wine this Awards for Chile. I'm trying well to think what he, what yeah, I do. I'm uh, not really sure, I do know. You've mentioned but, most uh, things, this is what you've told me anyway, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so he knows quite a lot about don't, chili. Don't believe a word so we, of it. we thought what we'd do, I thought what I would do is, is quiz Mr. Chili mm. um, for a few minutes uh, before, we, before we listen to Francisco, who really knows what he's talking about. Only joking. Uh, anyway, so Peter, Compare the two you have lived and worked. I've got, I've got my notes here. Oh, there we go. You okay. have lived and yeah. worked there in mm. Chile, yes. visited regularly, yes, written yeah. books, yeah, etc. Yeah. Et no, et yeah, yeah. As an expert on Chilean wine, what is your take on it? That's a massive question. Uh, I'm excited. We need I'm to fill excited. time. I know, we're always filling time. No, I'm excited. Chilean wine is one of the fastest moving wine scenes on the planet. It's, it's developing so quickly. Uh, it's a nightmare for writers and people like me because we like to issue definitive verdicts. And actually, you go there, you see it, it's amazing, you write about it, and then it, it's immediately out of date because it's moving so, so quickly. And when, when did you write your, your book? So on I wrote Chilean my book um, uh, 2004, I think it was, 2006. But yeah, things have changed dramatically since then. Uh, every year, things seem to change. And it's a good and a bad thing because novelty for novelty's sake is not brilliant. Mm. Um, but in Chilean wine, you get the sense that the strides they're taking every year are massive and we're starting to see you know Chile's obviously famed for its kind of cheap and cheerful Sauvignon Blanc Chardonnay Merlot and Cabernet but actually they've they're starting to make such interesting wines from a different range of variety, great varieties, Pinot Noir, Syrah, Riesling, Gavros, but I was, Romina. So I was going to say, I mean, you went, you visited quite recently. Yeah, didn't in February. You? February. Uh, it seems like another sort of uh, era. We've now. gone through a lot since February, haven't February we? This year. Um, what, what, what did you think when you went there? What was mm. the most exciting mm. thing? Uh, well, the most things that, that came out of that trip. So we wine writers get excited, overexcited quite easily, don't we? But I did two things on that trip, or saw two things that really excited me. First one was I went right down to the far south. So Chile obviously is this narrow, long strip of a country which has it crosses the most amazing latitudes. It's something like the difference between London and the Sahara. So if you think about that, it, and you have all different kinds of climates in between. I went right down to the south, which of course in Chile is cold. Um, to the island of Chiloé to spend time with Montes, who are developing an experimental planting there. And this is super cold territory, quite rainy. It's, it's totally different from the Chile we've known before now. But they're thinking of making really interesting white wines, maybe sparkling wine. Again, these are things that are new for Chile. So 
the boundaries are constantly being pushed back in Chile at all points of the compass. We're going into the Atacama Desert in the north, they're going high up into the Andes in the east, they're going more and more towards the Atlantic Ocean. There's only obviously so far you can go in the west, which is very cold. But for me, the most exciting part of that is the south because it's naturally rainier, therefore you don't have to irrigate. And obviously water is a big issue in Chile. They've had a drought for about the past 10 years. Uh, and so sustainability wise, the south is looking good as well. And also in terms of making more elegant wines, South means cooler, you've got a longer growing season in a world which is warming up. So I think for me the south of Chile is, is the future, that's exciting. One of the things So what I'm are the names up, that we look out for then if we Oh gosh, about there's so the many south. things. Well there's Ribera Payin makes lovely sparkling wine. Um, but even uh, just the regions in the stuff. south, oh, what, sorry, what, 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 would, what, would, what would we look out yeah, for? Yeah, well, Osorn, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Itata? Austral is, is a good name. Itata is a valley in the south. It's not super far south. Mayeco is a really a lovely valley starting to make. We've just tried some great Chardonnays and Pinots from there, haven't we? Um, but then Austral, Osorno, uh, these sort of areas. There's people doing things all over. Casa Silva are making some fantastic wines in the south. Um, so so I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to throw on. something in here because um, you know I think a lot of people, a lot of us, um, are very much used to seeing Chilean Merlot. Mm on a wine list probably, or on a shelf, and it's not very expensive, and we actually really like it. Where does that fit? What's, is that wrong? Should we not be buying that anymore? Should no. we be only buying the more expensive wines, not, or should no, we be absolutely. buying across the... Not at all. I think this is where I was going to come on to in my second point. You know, we've got the wines in, in this tasting, the Erasmus wines, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, are your stock in trade, um, from Chile. And they're not particularly expensive. But this is the thing, value is transferable. So value can be good value at £3 or £5, but it can also be good value at £12 and £20 because what, you, what that means is, at that price, it's good value for, compared to other things in the market. And I think that's what Chile is doing brilliantly now, particularly between, say, 8 and £25. The wines you're getting, compare them to other wines from around the world at the same price, they are phenomenal very often. And I think one of the things that's happened recently, and it's been sort of almost provoked by these kind of new, exciting, far-flung things being developed, is that the kind of centre of gravity, the traditional winemakers in Chile, and I guess Erasmus will be part of that, but they have actually been probably leaders in this as well. The big producers making the big wines, which are your Merlots, they are your Cabernets, they have reappraised their approach, they've changed their approach. And now, you know, whereas in the past Chile and Merlot could have been something was, you know, it was all right, it was, it was fine, now we're starting to see those Merlots, even at the relatively decent prices, much more exciting, much more drinkable, much more appetising, much more easy to drink with your meal, much more maybe the talk of the place that they're made and the people who are making them. So we're starting to see individuality, diversity, a bit of interest, frankly, in your question asked about Chile and Merlot. Well, it's not just Chile and Merlot, it's Merlot from Colchagua made by whoever, Merlot from Aconcagua made by whoever. These are, and that's what makes a wine, a wine industry inter uh, interesting. And, and in terms of, um, you know, Chile is a lovely country to grow grapes. It's lovely and hot and sunny. Is climate change having an effect? Because obviously what you're talking about are wines that are actually fresher these days, fresher and less sort of big and chunky. How is that possible if, if the country is getting warmer? Yeah, that's a really good point. Well, Chile's uniquely blessed. As I said, it covers the most amazing range of latitudes. It literally runs from north to south. Um, along that southwestern edge of it's South really, America. It's really long and um, thin, isn't it? You know, it? Yeah, you can yeah. dial up pretty much any combination of uh, aspect and, and, and elevation and climate within that. So climate change is affecting Chile. I think one of the things is this, this drought I mentioned, the lack of water, which is becoming a serious issue, especially in the north of the country, because the north of the country is very arid. The Atacama Desert, one of the driest places on, on the world, is the boundary between Chile and Peru to the north. Um, so I think that's definitely happening. It seems to be from the research that the um, climate change weather-wise is affecting these sort of parts of the southern hemisphere less because there's bigger bodies of water near them. So the massive Pacific on one side of Chile and the Atlantic on the other side kind of insulates the southern hemisphere a little bit, and Chile particularly. But even so, temperatures are changing. And to my mind, that's why I'm saying the south is exciting. I think we're seeing Chilean wine sort of shift south a little bit um, as climate change starts to affect. And as, you know, for example, water... Uh, less abundant, actually moving to the south, you've got natural rainfall and your vines can, can use that rather than irrigation water, which is just more sustainable. Right, I want two tips now. Two oh, top oof. tips. Right, oh, okay, no, no, really? I'm going to say, so I, my, my first tip I want uh, is I want oh, yeah. a, a grape variety oh. or a region, so a wine that we can, that's a bit different that we could buy for Christmas. It doesn't have to be a specific wine, okay. but something for Christmas mm. and 
given none of us can travel at the moment and we're dreaming of traveling, where's the one place in Chile that you would plan to go to when we can all travel again? Um, in Chile or generally? Chile. Sorry, within Chile. Um, oh, goodness me. Well, I mean, I'm going to start with the second one. So where to travel to if you want to travel to Chile? If I want if to just travel. go oh. to Chile. I want to imagine I'm, I'm traveling. Well, I'm going to do it for you because I, you're solar powered. I know this. You, <laughs> you, you don't work in the winter. It's got to be basically. somewhere Basically, you hibernate. So you need somewhere. So I'd go to the Atacama. I'd, go to, I'd fly into Santiago, have a look. Into, people always sort of go past Santiago. It's busy, yes, but it's an amazing city. Uh, but then fly out to the north, to the Atacama Desert. Um, and it's just, it's the most, uh, it's like being on the surface of the moon. It's like being somewhere completely different. If you want to go somewhere after all this is over and we can travel, that is just like, takes you totally away. The Atacama is amazing. San Pedro de Atacama is an amazing little oasis in, this, in, this, in the middle of the desert. There are salt flats, there's flamingos, there's, mm. there's geysers, there's hot water baths. The, the hotels are amazing. You can eat and drink like a king. And... I, that's the place to go. If if not, go down south, but it's colder. You sort of more no, iceberg well, type no, no, territory. No, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. There you go. Stop, okay. no, no, but no, the no, lakes are amazing as well. Hot so I'd say that. Oh, in terms of why? Oh gosh, that's really. T I mean, I would revisit Chilean Cabernet Sauvignon because oh. you know this is something which again people think, oh, maybe it's a bit boring Chilean Cabernet. Seriously, the styles that are being produced now are so elegant at the top end. They are. Yeah. Amazing. How much do I need to spend to get a really nice Chilean Cabernet? Well, I mean, that depends. I mean, you know, but I'd say, uh, you know, £20 for a really special bottle, £25, you can get some amazing wines, probably worth, you know, twice as much from elsewhere. But, you know, Is we're seeing Chilean Cabernets at 50, 70, 100 and over, and they are an serious wines. Well, yeah, I mean, they have some. Um, Seigneur, Vigneur de Chadwick, you know, are, are serious top level bottles. So I'd say, I'd say, have another look at Chilean Cabernet. And if you want to go a bit more on the wild side, Chilean Pinot. Um, Pinot is, Noir. is so exciting at the moment. Fabulous. And, you know, Fabulous. Out, right. Out. Okay. I think it's almost time. I think I've quizzed you for long enough. Yeah. Uh, but we'd just like to thank again our sponsors. But we also wanted to say mm. that if you have any problems at all with viewing any of these videos today, just contact hello at thewinefestival.co.uk and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to sort it out for you. You can also contact via our social media channels. All the details are on the website. Absolutely. Just to say, this video will stay yeah. up afterwards. So for those of you watching, after the event, hello, thanks for thanks If you'd for like to listen in. to Peter again. You don't probably want to do that. You can fast forward to Francisco and see him again, who's coming up. Um, and of course, there is an, another masterclass coming up straight after this too. So let's hand over now to Francisco Betig and the Erasuris team. Hello. Um, Chile has very special geography, uh, very extreme geography in Chile we have. Uh, the north is very dry with the Atacama Desert. The south is very cold with the Patagonian ice fields. And in the east we have the Andes Range. And in the west we have the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. So we're pretty much like an island with these extreme conditions. Um, but in the central part of Chile, we have a diversity of soils and a Mediterranean climate uh, with a long dry season and most of the rain concentrated in winter that allow us to produce um, and fully ripe and produce world class uh, varieties, particularly red varieties like Cabernet, Merlot uh, and others. And in the coast, since it's cooler because we have the Humboldt current influence, we can produce beautiful wines uh, under the, the cool climate conditions like Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay and others. Most of the traditional and classic wineries were established in, in Chile in the outskirts of Santiago, the capital, uh, but in the case of Viña Rasuris, the home terroir is uh, the Aconcagua Valley. Aconcagua Valley is uh, located 100 kilometers north of the capital, Santiago, uh, and it's a transverse valley that goes from the Andes to the Pacific. So we have a big diversity of, again, climates and soil from very cool areas like the Aconcao Costa vineyard, only 10 kilometers from the Pacific, and vineyards inland that are warm um, to produce uh, Bordeaux varieties uh, inland where the wine is established. Uh, where, when the Maximiano the founder uh, decided to establish Viña Rasuris in 1870. He was looking for the best terroir to produce um, 
red varieties mainly in the, in the inland Aconcagua. So uh, he established the winery here uh, to uh, fully ripe the Cabernet and other varieties in the, in the vine. Um, we, we will um, taste uh, four different wines of the, of the portfolio of the winery. We will start from the coast inland with our uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay from Aconcagua Costa and then we will move to uh, Panquehue uh, where the, the red varieties are planted, red vineyards are planted with Merlot and Cabernet Max Reserve. Um, in the case of Sauvignon Blanc, uh, this is the 2019. 2019 is a, is a rather warm vintage, um, moderately warm. Uh, so the challenge was how to keep the freshness and the acidity in these wines. But since we're very close to the coast, only 10 kilometers from the Pacific, it's a very fresh area where uh, in 19 we picked uh, quite early in order to uh, keep the, f the balance, the acidity. Uh, this, this wine is uh, fermented in, in stainless steel tanks. 30% um, of the, the grape was uh, uh, whole cluster press. The rest was distemmed and we ferment at a very low temperature and the alcohol is very moderate, it's only 13 alcohol, 13 alcohol degrees uh, with very nice acidity, very intense in the nose, lots of citrus, some herbal notes, green grass uh, and in the palate we have a beautiful tension, very nice uh, vibrancy and lingering um, where we find again some fruit, citrus, uh, and floral notes. In the case of uh, our Chardonnay, this is wild ferment, also coming from the coast. Wild ferment means we don't use any uh, commercial yeast. It's 100% uh, whole cluster pressed in order to have a very clean, pure juice. Uh, then it goes to barrel for uh, fermentation, 100% barrel ferment um, for roughly 11 months. Uh, only um, one, one use, second use, no new oak in here. We're looking for intensity, fresh uh, style, very balanced oak. We want that the fruit to be uh, the, the, the main character here and not not the, the, the oak. So very nice creaminess. Uh, we also have a very moderate alcohol in this vintage, 13 alcohol. Uh, beautiful Cabernet that, that has some uh, tropical fruit but fresh with nice pH. Um, so it's a wine that will uh, age for a little bit if you want but it's, it's really uh, intense and, and ready to, to, to enjoy. In the case of um, our Merlot estate, um, this is 19, again, hot vintage, but we were very aware of, of the conditions, so we picked and harvest very fast and very early in order to preserve the fruit. And here we have quite a lot of red fruit, some plum, um, some balsamic notes, but very intense and fresh. This goes for roughly six months in, in French used barrels uh, in order to have mainly the typicity here in the state uh, range. We want to have the typicity of the, the variety, which is fruit, very nice uh, soft tannins. that goes uh, very softly in the palate. It's a wine uh, that shows the, the freshness um, that we can achieve in these places where, because uh, we, we pick quite early so it doesn't reflect a hot, hot vintage. And finally, our Cabernet Sauvignon uh, 2018 Max Reserva 
this is a beautiful one that uh, is very important for the Nerasuris because where we can showcase the potential of the, the valley, the terroir, in order to produce a very, very complex uh, but um, affordable Cabernet. This is, uh, of course, hand-picked. Um, goes into the um, sorting table, then fermentation in stainless steel tanks, and goes to barrel uh, French oak um, for 12 months. And after that, is is bottled um, and the wine is showing the cassis, the all the typicity of cabernet, a little bit of cedar, red fruit, blue, uh, blueberry, um, and a, a lot of a structure. But the dining is very is very round, is very polished. Uh, 18 is a beautiful vintage, considered to be one of the best vintages ever in Chile. Uh, very balanced in climate, so we, we managed to produce a really beautiful Cabernet that um, has some years to, to evolve and to improve in body. Um, we invite you to celebrate with us the 150 years anniversary. We hope you enjoy our wines and thank you for uh, your support. Cheers.